This is Make It Plain. Make It Plain. M I P. With my Samella, my Fumo. Mark Thompson. Make It Plain. Get woke. God bless you. Get woke. Folks, MIP is now COVID free, meaning free to all subscribers as we navigate this pandemic. We're thinking about everyone and we've got to get through this together. So for a limited time, no fee to subscribe to make it plain on your favorite podcast app. Ladies and gentlemen, it's always a pleasure to have another friend of the show on on Make It Plain here, Congressman Eric Swalwell, who has been trending on Twitter. Uh, how how are you, man? First of all, how's the family and everything? You all you all safe and sound in this pandemic? You know, uh, family is good. Um, they want my kids want a substitute teacher. I keep trying to expel them every single day out of my startup school, and then they come back for dinner. So uh, what the hell? Yeah, yeah. So. Tell us what's going on, man, with, with you and, and Richard Grinnell. That just kind of just kind of happened, didn't it? Yeah, you know, this guy has been really shoveling uh, in dirt and burying evidence for the president. And now the president is trying to disrupt the Flynn prosecution. And Grinnell said right before he left that he was going to release these tapes to show there was a conspiracy against Flynn. And I've been asking for the last couple of weeks, well, where are the tapes? Where are the tapes? Well, now Grinnell's out. Just wanted to check in with him. Where are the tapes? And uh, he started going through the, the crazy uh, Russia hoax rabbit hole that the president uh, often says. And so I just kind of laid out the evidence uh, that we have. And uh, he didn't really want to engage uh, on the evidence. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and speaking of some of that evidence, you know, where are we on getting the rest of what was in the Mueller report released? Well, we are in the courts right now. Uh, and again, for a, an administration that says that they're transparent, uh, we shouldn't have to go to the courts. And if it was a hoax and there's no evidence there, uh, they should not fight us and just turn it all over. And the reason there's no Flynn tapes right now and the reason they won't release the Mueller, uh, you know, grand jury report is because there is evidence of collusion. Uh, it did not meet the criminal standard, and Mueller was not able to go after the finances, which I think limited his ability uh, to meet a criminal standard. But uh, still, uh, there's a lot of evidence that we have not seen. A fifth of the report that we have seen is redacted, and so uh, we're still in the courts. But, you know, I, I guess the larger point here, Mark, is that while this guy, Cornell, is working as the director of intelligence, overseeing uh, and managing intelligence, we have a damn pandemic spreading across the globe, and he's working to try and exonerate the president while other countries are taking steps to lock down and uh, stop travel from China. Dozens did so before we actually did. Uh, and so I think the larger point is there's a cost for trying to bury evidence and cover tracks for the president, and sadly, we're paying for it right now uh, in the COVID response. And also, does that not also distract us from really getting ready for what Russia is planning for the fall if they're not already in operation already? Yeah, and, and so Director Grinnell was the first director of national intelligence who refused to come in uh, and brief uh, the Congress. Uh, but uh, there have been press reports that people who have briefed on the Russia threat uh, have been taken off uh, the case. So I have a concern that you have hardworking FBI agents trying to defend this country and protect against the threat, uh, but the threat is not being relayed to us through the Office of National Intelligence. And now you have there the new director, John Ratcliffe, who, as you saw in the impeachment trials uh, in, the, in the House, was one of the biggest defenders uh, of the president. So I, I'm just concerned that we're not going to get the real on what's going on with Russia, and we're going to be just as susceptible to an interference campaign this election. But Mark, I'm I'm not worried about that. I, I, we don't talk really much about voter uh, interference or voter suppression because uh, the truth is, if if it's close, uh, we didn't do our job. Uh, if we have to worry about that, uh, we didn't do our job of mobilizing and organizing and getting people to the ballot box. And so, uh, just as I was told when I was playing college sports, don't make it close. Just yeah. run up the score, uh, and you won't have to worry about that gauntlet of misinformation, suppression, and interference. 
I know you, I know you're headed to the airport, but quickly, um, I want to get your thoughts or your reaction to what we're seeing in Minneapolis and, and this spate of, of violence against African Americans. Uh, well, first, uh, it's just, it's awful. It's horrible uh, what happened to Mr. Floyd, uh, and he deserves uh, justice. Uh, he should have uh, gone home uh, that night, uh, and, and people are upset uh, because he's not the first African American uh, to be killed uh, by the police. Uh, and sadly, uh, if, if we don't do enough, uh, he won't be the last. So people need to keep peacefully uh, going to the streets and demonstrating and insisting uh, that their leaders uh, put in place reforms so that this does not uh, happen again. I, look, I come from a law enforcement family. My dad was a cop. I was a prosecutor. I have two brothers uh, who work very hard as police officers uh, in Alameda County. Uh, and, you know, I, I want uh, a justice system for all. And, and right now, that's not the justice system uh, that uh, Black men especially live under in America. And knowing what happened in 2016, one of my fears is that, that, is that this type of thing is something else Russia can use on social media and online to further divide Americans and even, unfortunately, mobilize Trump's base against African Americans. Yep, that, that's absolutely right. We saw that in 2016. Uh, and, you know, frankly, yesterday we saw the president tweeting about it. Uh, and my message to him was just, just stay out, right? Like, we don't need some you know, tr Trump swooping in uh, and bringing Trump justice. Uh, we just need him to, to stay out uh, because I, I think he's cheaply trying to exploit this uh, for political gain. Uh, people have been working on this issue for a very long time. Uh, and uh, what we need is local, uh, county, state, and, and federal uh, reforms. But this family does not need to be politically weaponized uh, by the president. Folks, uh, he's, he's, uh, he's wearing his mask in the car and being safe, but probably also violating something else by zooming with me while he's driving. Zooming while driving, we do not recommend, but you should wear your mask. So he's, he's doing it half right. <laughs> Congressman, uh, uh, good to see you, man. Okay. Of course. And safe, right, travels, safe travels on the way home. Love to the family. All right, man. Thank you. All right. gentlemen, my guest today served in the U.S. State Department in a number of different positions, including as a member of the Secretary of State's policy planning staff, where he focused on political military affairs and nonproliferation, special assistant to the Under Secretary for Arms Control and International Security. He was a speechwriter to then Secretary of State John Kerry and senior advisor to the assistant Secretary of State for Political and Military Affairs. Not only is he a senior fellow at American Progress, but he is also with the Moscow Project. Once again, we're happy to have here on the show, Max Bergman. Max, uh, glad to have you back. Glad you and the family are doing well these days. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. So, um, we have the situation with Flynn. We have um, them trying to create the Trump administration and DOJ trying to complete, uh, 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 concoct rather, I should say, another controversy with Obamagate, whatever that is, um, and uh, accuse Obama administration of unmasking people. Uh, we have them trying to conceal the Mueller report, uh, possibly with the help of the Supreme Court. So really, all of these things that we've always talked about, while they have become overshadowed by COVID, among other things, all of these matters are still pretty ripe, aren't they? Yeah. And, you know, and I think as Trump's poll numbers drop uh, nationally and in critical states, you know, one poll in Arizona had him down to Biden by nearly 10 points. Uh, we're going to see a lot more of this because, frankly, with the economy collapsing, which was his sort of only sort of positive leg to stand on from a from a political campaign perspective, you know, all he's going to be left with is trying to sort of recreate the magic form of 2016, which was butter, you know, the Hillary email scandal that was the a whole obsession. And so, you know, you know, he wants he needs a scandal 
to or needs multiple scandals, something to stick to Biden to try to uh, tear him down. Uh, and so that's why we're going to see a lot of, of effort to sort of uh, muddy the waters here. So that's sort of, I think, the general political perspective. And the thing that's working for him, um, uh, you know, in this this go around is that, you know, he sort of, it was dumb luck last time that James Comey just did galactically stupid things and, you know, and, and had this sort of out to get Hillary Clinton and, and 11 days out from the election, released a letter and politically intervened in that election in obscene ways. Um, you know, that really helped Donald Trump. But now Trump has you know, a, a political agent, ally, and, and bar as his attorney general that that is totally willing to do uh, something similar. What's going against him is that everyone's seen the shtick. We know that this is what Trump does. Uh, I think the press are more prepared than they were four years ago to a degree. And while the press have sort of bought on and followed some of these scandals, the fact is that, like, they've sort of faded away, too. So, um, you know, there isn't really much there. But I think the broader point that I would, I think it's also worth making, and this came across in a Politico story uh, from folks in the Trump campaign, is the message they're trying to push now is that, that the establishment that Washington has from its very beginning, even before Trump took office, created this plot to try to destroy and take down Trump and try to hurt his presidency by concocting this Russia investigation. And so Donald Trump now having survived the Russia investigation and survived this impeachment nonsense, um, if he's reelected, will change Washington. I.e. Donald Trump is the change agent and Biden and Obama and others represent the establishment, represent the broken system. Mm -hmm. And so now if you reelect Trump, you get your change agent. That's the argument and message they're going for. And that was clear that they were doing this from the from the get go. Mm -hmm. And this was one of the clear dangers that I sort of had thrown out there repeatedly banging my head against the wall when Mueller released his report to House Democrats uh, to Congress. And House Democrats effectively shrugged. shrugged. Now that we spent the last, you know, from April is when the report came out. In the the next four months until August, there was a collective sort of internal fight within the Democratic Party over whether to pursue impeachment. We forget this, but before Ukraine, you know, we, uh, late August, a majority of the Democratic caucus had just come out in favor of impeachment. It, but this was really divisive, with one side saying. You know, how can you not go forward on impeachment? He obstructed justice. Here are the 10 counts. It's so obvious. And then look at the first 190 pages of the Russian investigation. He clearly colluded with the Russians. And then another part being like, well, you know, then we get in this big political fight over the scandal. and We want to talk about health care. And it was a political conversation. But what the side against moving forward on impeachment over the Russian investigation missed is that not moving forward meant that you conveyed to the public that this was all about nothing. This was all made up. This was all just fantasy. And so it's made it much easier for Trump to now say, oh, this Russia thing was nonsense and have the public sort of buy it. Because like, oh yeah, Mueller, like nothing really came of it. The collective memory now is that Mueller was a dud. It wasn't, yeah. but yeah. it was the reaction led to that. So, um, yeah. No, 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 no. It's very good. But just when you say the Democrats shrug, I think it was that in addition to a couple of things, but maybe all this equals a shrug. A shrug. And as you and I have discussed, um, Barr took control and spun it when he, you know, went and pulled Mueller off of it, which I still, I think you and I agree. Yeah. I don't think Mueller was finished. Um, I think Barr just ended it. Um, and then he spun it and wrote his own summary. And it, it may have even been somewhat worse than Shrub too, Max, in the sense that Democrats put so much, or I should say, gave so much deference to Mueller. It yeah. was as if they were expecting him to make an impeachment referral in a literal sense. And I'm not saying he, I'm not saying he didn't. Yeah. But it's almost as if they needed him to put that in the memo. This yeah. is an official impeachment referral. Which I don't even know if you if you're required to do what you need to do, um, but between them kind of wanting that emphatically laid out, uh, and and Barr spinning it with the help of the mainstream media, you, you're right. It would it was a dud. 
Uh, you know, and I'm going to ask you this too. Also, some people have talked about uh, Mueller's performance in the hearings, yeah, and how that may have undermined things. And there have been a lot of theories about that. Um, that his performance itself did not uh, uh, lend itself to establishing more uh, gravity, gravitas, and credibility for the report. What, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, I think that definitely had an impact, right? It, his performance was underwhelming. Um, and the fact that he also wouldn't say very much. Yeah. Uh, and I, th I think, you know, it was both didn't, it wasn't this commanding presence. He was built up to be, you know, right. a, a guy who could solve every problem. And then it didn't, at times he didn't look like he could recall what was in the report. Um, and, and everyone said that he looked like he had lost a step. I think what the mistake, the mistake of that hearing, when I think back on it was really, he should have came with his team. Democrats would have insisted on that in the house that with the expert lawyers that worked under him, that, that managed that right you know he was the quarterback of a very big investigation with lots of uh top-notch lawyers that can speak to certain parts of the reports better than other people than can and yet it was all on Mueller. and then he didn't say anything um so i think that was one of the impacts i think like look when we go back i think the big failing here politically uh and when i when i you know, when I started and said, oh, Democrats messed up in the reaction. And I think that's definitely true. Um, mm. be, but I also think it's a little bit harsh, right? That it's, you know, it made sense to want to have a conversation about, is this the right thing to do to impeach this guy over this? Like, that's a reasonable thing to want to have a discussion. But when you're talking about the politics of impeachment, that if you were going to impeach him, you had to win the political conversation and convince the country that this was so bad. You're not going to convince the country and that this is so bad and what he did at obstructing justice and breaking the law and, co and colluding with the Russians uh, is so bad when you have a four month conversation about whether it's bad, right? You're just not, and so you have to come out of the gate just, you know, swinging. And so that's number one. And I think Democrats were caught off guard because they expected the report to not be that bad because Barr had told them that and Barr right. was seen as a reputable figure. But I think when we go back to Mueller, I think there's a few things at play here. Uh, one, uh, one is on Mueller, and a few of them, a few of the reasons why the report seemed underwhelming aren't on Mueller. The first reason I think that's on Mueller is that he was clearly put under very tight constraints about what he could and could not investigate. Uh, he never went, uh, he never looked at Trump's finances, and the reason why the finances are important is that if a country wanted to help a campaign, they would give it money. And if they're going to give Trump money, who spent $66 million of money, I would think that would be a, an important place to look. And they didn't look at that. They didn't get the Deutsche Bank records. Um, right. So they were in a right. box. Right. They were put right. in a box. And Mueller's a bureaucrat in some ways. And he stayed in the box. He didn't refuse to break out of it. So I think that's, that's number one. The second is I think the FBI, and this has been totally lost, right? Right now we're talking about the FBI trying to railroad Michael Flynn. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What what actually came out in this Inspector General report from uh, Horowitz of the FBI in December, which Barr released kind of in the midst of the Ukraine uh, craziness and sort of no one really paid attention to. And the thing that was focused on was that the FBI um, would sort of basically cut corners in its FISA of Carter Page. And, and progressives and conservatives alike said, oh, FBI shouldn't do that. And that's correct. But what was sort of missed was that the report is all about how messed up, how bureaucratically bungled, how oh, the lack of energy of the investigation was in 2016. So mm. i.e., as it was going on, mm -hmm. as you know, they were conspiring, colluding in, you know, throughout the campaign, what was actually happening is the FBI was in Washington, not in New York, not in the field office, they're in headquarters, very scared that it would come out that they were investigating the candidate. It's the exact opposite of what, the, what Trump was saying. They were, didn't want it to come out that they were investigating. And so they didn't do much investigating. Mm -hmm. And it was, it, and so when you see these text messages between Lisa Page and Peter Strzok, what they're talking about is, hey, like, do we treat this as a normal counterintelligence investigation? And what you do in a normal counterintelligence investigation, let's say, you know, we think Mark Thompson is working with 
you know, the, the Peruvians or something. Well, we would like, you know, so the U.S. government gets a warrant. They start monitoring you. They're paying attention. Maybe they see some contact, but they don't just go and arrest you. What they do is they spend years building a case. That is normal counterintelligence work. But here we had an election. And so there's this debate about whether you do it normally or whether you need to be super aggressive. And what they did was just acted normally as if this were a normal thing. And in fact, they, it was even worse than that. They didn't even monitor the president or candidate Trump. They focused on these four guys around him. There's no FISA on Trump. Mm -hmm. um, and so what that meant was when the election ended, they had no real, they didn't have a lot of evidence. They had not a lot of investigating. So when Mueller comes around, which is not until May of 2017, he's picking up the pieces of a corrupt investigation. Yeah. And so what we have here, and so you could, you could not use that to say, oh, well, I'm, you know, Max Bergman just wants to really convince everybody that Trump was in cahoots with Russia and see he has no evidence. And now he's blaming the FBI. Basically. But then what's come out is, are all these sort of snippets, right? Clear things where you're like, oh, my God, oh, my God. You know, June 9th meeting, meeting with a Russian agent in, in the Havana Club on August 2nd, sharing polling down, all these things. And yet we don't, the FBI doesn't have anything on it because the FBI wasn't paying attention. So that's not on Mueller that he didn't have um, a lot to work with. And so he needed to turn witnesses. He needed to turn Manafort. He needed, to, and then when you have Trump, you know, throwing out pardon potential, it makes it really hard. I think the last um, element here is that Mueller, um, you know, he could have gone after Trump more aggressively. And one of the fights of a grand jury testimony that were, uh, you know, that the House Judiciary is trying to get declassified um, and trying to read in which the White House is blocking and going all the Supreme Court. One speculation is it shows that Trump lied um, mm -hmm. in his written questions, but they never tried to get him physically there. Right. They never brought Don Jr. in. And so there was a lot of these, they took, they really soft peddled it in a way that like they didn't do for Clinton in 90, you know, with Monica Lewinsky. And so th there you had a bureaucrat company guy clearly sort of passed it, not willing to fight the bureaucratic battles. And then when it came to sort of rolling up the end of his investigation, uh, Barr just sort of seemed to put the screws on him. And I think there's a lot of questions about what was declassified or what was redacted and what is it. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, it's sort of a long, long answer, but I think no, there's no. a lot, a lot there that really should be investigated by by congressional Democrats about how this all went down. And it's interesting that it was actually the opposite of what Trump is alleging, in the sense that um, they were trying to not expose themselves as, investi as investigating the candidate, yet. Comey felt the need those 11 days out <laughs> to, to announce that he was investigating Hillary. And, and you probably remember this. Remember there was a, a uh, classified hearing with the House members and Comey around that time. And Maxine Waters came out to the press gaggle. Um, and she said, I can't tell you because it's classified, but all I can say is that the FBI director has no integrity. And I haven't had a chance to ask her, but I'm convinced that's what she was saying. I'm sure it was disclosed to the House members that there were two investigations going on, one of Trump and one of Clinton, Hillary Clinton. And he was announcing one and holding press conferences on one. Uh, at first, in the early one, remember when he said, oh, well, there was nothing here, which was unusual. Um, and then the one that happened 11 days out. Um, yeah. so, so that was part of that contradiction. And now, I, and I noticed the, the Moscow Project had tweeted, you know, some of the coverage of, of, of Christopher Ray now, who, who having been badgered, is now willing to open this investigation, an investigation of the investigation <laughs> of, of Michael yeah. Flynn. I, I do this for us, though, because, I mean, we don't know, I mean, th there's a potential of a pardon, there's a potential of all of this being dropped, obviously. Um, let's recap what Michael Flynn actually did, if you would, Max, so people can understand, even if he walks free, yeah, they can still know and understand what this character did. I cannot get 
the picture of him at the dinner with Putin and Jill Stein out of my head. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and I always have to do full disclosure. I've been a part of independent political movements throughout 2016. Jill Stein was a regular on my show. Had not seen the picture. Most of us didn't know anything about it. And I don't know if you're aware, but the um, overseas press, European press was covering it. And yep. the Green Party in Europe denounced her months before we knew about it. And it didn't even make the U.S. press. So it was, they even said the United States shouldn't, uh, voters shouldn't support her, United States Greens shouldn't support her, but nobody saw it. Cause yeah. we don't, you know, look at it. So, but not to go into jail, I just like to let people know that, 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 that also troubles me. Cause if I had known, it's like, oh my God, there's, there's no telling how I would have approached it or even questioned her. But I can't get that picture out of my mind. But, but talk to us now as this debate rages about whether or not Flynn, the charges against Flynn should be dropped. Yeah. So let me just make a quick point on the on the, the Comey timeline because it's, I, I and I I assume uh, that's what the congresswoman was referring to because you know Harry Reid wrote a letter in October being like in late October saying we know you know <laughs> what we all know about the thing that you know that's we right. know that's, about that's right <laughs> and come on you're right. talking about one person like come on and right. and and I think. You know, the October 31st story, the New York Times, the headline, FBI sees no clear link between Trump and Russia. And what's critical about that is, remember when I talked about earlier about Lisa Page and Peter Strzok and like they're debating about whether to go slow or not? Well, they're trying to keep their investigation a secret, but they failed. They failed to keep it a secret. But then instead of then going, becoming aggressive because the Trump folks would know that they're potentially being investigated. They, the FBI lied to the New York Times. Like they lied to the New York Times and said uh, that, no, 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 we looked into it. There's nothing there. Yeah. And, and so what that meant when we just put it, think about this in investigative terms, mm -hmm. well, A, the subject of the investigation has been tipped off the Trump campaign. And yet you don't really have any ramp up and aggression of the investigation or energy until Mueller, which is May. So you gave the Trump campaign basically from October to May, October 2016 to May of 2017, to just cover their tracks effectively. Uh, and, and that's why these servers and other things were all shut down. Now, some of that may have nothing to do with anything, but you just, it's really hard to know how effective an investigation would be. And so for Mueller, what he did is like, well, I didn't have the smoking gun because, I, well, I had a number of clear smoking guns, but I didn't like catch them on tape because we weren't able to do a sting operation a la the mob. But so I did the next best thing and got him, you know, where the president clearly committed all these crimes and obstructing justice, which would normally send someone to jail. Al Capone went to jail, not for, you know, mobbing, but for tax evasion. Um, so then when it comes to, so Michael Flynn, um, I think what's clear is that Michael Flynn was a major counterintelligence risk and that the intelligence community in particular was terrified of Michael Flynn and saw not only him uh, at the table with Vladimir Putin, um, which the intelligence community was would be fully aware of, uh, because, you know, this is a guy that had all the U.S. government secrets, right? He was a head. Michael Flynn of the Defense Intelligence Agency, which is not as important as the CIA or National Security Agency, but is one of the major U.S. intel organs. Um, and so he had access to all this information, and there he is sitting next to Vladimir Putin, who would have been cons highly concerned, which is why I assume Obama, when he meets with Trump in the Oval Office, says, don't hire this guy. The other thing about Flynn, so that's number one, the, the connections to Russia, but that's not even the most, you know, like, you know, that's sort of in some ways the most foggy of Flynn's connections. Like we know he was there. We know he took some money from RT and was paid by the Russians a little bit, not like us, not a millions of dollars, but right. tens of thousands of dollars right. still matters, still very significant. But then the second aspect was that Flynn um, was clearly uh, working for the Turkish government. He was an unregistered foreign agent for Turkey. The day of the election, he wrote an op-ed that was basically straight out of Tur uh, Turkey talking points, uh, the government's talking points. And we have to remember the leader of Turkey, Erdogan, 
uh, is not a Democrat, right? He's not a, a small D Democrat. He has moved Turkey in a very autocratic direction. That would have been highly concerning. And Flynn was also involved in this weird nuclear scheme called the Mideast Marshall Plan, which would involve working with Gulf states and Russia and other countries to push nuclear power for the Middle East, which was involved all sorts of weird shadiness. So when you look at the declassification of who sought to unmask Michael Flynn, it what, most of the declassification requests about, and what unmasking means is to find out when you read intelligence reports as US persons, and so wanting to know who is this US persons being referred to, all happened before the call with Kislyak, i.e. Flynn was engaged in this other shady stuff involving potentially nuclear power deals and in the government of Turkey, maybe in, in maybe meetings with Kislyak uh, and, and the Russian ambassador. So there was a lot there with Michael Flynn. So that brings us to the call that he had uh, at the end of the year on, on in December 2016. I think it was December 29th, if I'm correct. And this was right before Obama announced, uh, was going to announce sanctions, or right after Obama announced sanctions against Russia. I thought about this call a lot. On its face, it's difficult to see, like Flynn may have a point. This doesn't mean I think Flynn is right. I think right. like the way it's described is that Flynn uh, told Kislyak, don't worry about sanctions when we're in office we're like not going to be for this and this has been said that flynn was undercutting us russia sanctions and undercutting obama and that was bad and so uh and then he lied to the vice president and had to go right here's what i don't buy i don't buy that i don't buy that flynn had to go because he lied to the vice president uh and frankly flynn talking to the russians and saying yeah obama just did this thing we're not ground we're not game for it isn't really that to me all that significant the second the other aspect is that i don't get why flynn never just owned it and said yeah i called the russians and said don't sanction us back don't evict our people because you know what when we're in office we're going to try to get rid of this mm -hmm, well mm -hmm. you know what that's actually good for u.s interest to not have our diplomats kicked out so what i am constructing here is what there is actually what the right is now saying that uh, there's nothing to see here there's none of this was bad but then release the damn call. Like, let us read the transcript. And what, what I find highly suspicious is that they didn't make the, Flynn never made the point that what he did and said was entirely above board because he's protecting and looking out for US interests. Instead he lied, instead he lied to the vice president about it or lied and tried to conceal it. So I, I think, and so while Barr is releasing some things like uh, about, you know, the FBI's notes and, a note about an FBI agent saying, uh, well, are we just trying to entrap Michael Flynn or something to that effect? Mm -hmm. The answer is like, maybe, because they thought this guy was a threat to the US national security. But what they're not releasing is also the call that he had and the transcript of the call, which to me may hint at some larger nefariousness, likely. And maybe it's not clearly stated like, hey, uh, you know, we pledge to do X, Y, and Z if you do, like, we know you guys worked with us and included and interfered in the election, so now we're going to do, <laughs> get rid of sanctions. It's like, I don't think it says that, but it may allude to certain things that when you read it are like, oh, that sounds really bad. And that yeah. opens up the door to a clear sense that there was a quid pro quo or some other yeah. arrangement. Yeah. yeah. So I think there's a lot more there. Um, mm -hmm. And what's clear is when Flynn also pled guilty to lying to the FBI, which is a crime, even if the FBI wanted to get you to lie to them. I mean, like, if you're <laughs> like that, I don't I don't get why the FBI wanting to get you to lie to them so they can arrest you doesn't make something a crime. Um, Flynn pled guilty in large part not to be charged with other crimes, such as violating the Foreign Agents Registration Act and other things. So it's not as if like this was a deal. Like he made a deal and now, you know, he's got bar in his corner letting him off the hook with the deal that he made from the U.S. government. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like Pete Rose, you know, and don't get me wrong, yeah. Pete, you know, holds the record for most hits. Pete, Pete did some good things in his career. Uh, but Pete agreed to the lifetime ban. A lot of people don't know that. So it's yeah, the same yeah. situation. When you plead and agree, 
and it to something, then you're going along with it. And it, it to me, I just think it suggests less of a victimization. Now, uh, and you're right, it probably, in Flynn's case, covers up something else, you know, because I'm sure that's how deals are made. You know, you plead to this, we'll let the other stuff go. And you're right, why not release the call if it's no big deal? Why don't, why don't you want people uh, to hear it? Just share the call. Uh, you started out mentioning Biden. Um, I want to go a couple more directions. Um, so there's this judge, right, in the Ukraine. And so they're going to open up this case against Biden. So that's still ongoing. They're, they're still going to work with the Ukraine to try to get some dirt or, or create some drama for Joe Biden. Yeah, effectively, um, Zelensky and members of the Ukrainian government, you know, I'm not necessarily sure if Zelensky control the pre Ukrainian president is necessarily up to him. There's, you know, Ukraine operates in a complex way, just the way the U.S. government does sometimes. Right. Uh, but as I said, decided apparently, you know, a wild card cat judge to to re to open the investigation that Trump was asking for back when he was trying to extort the Ukrainian government. Um, and what's clear is that Rudy Giuliani and others have been working with uh, pro Kremlin elements of the of Ukraine to throw out lies and smears about the vice president. And they uh, held a, a, um, a, conference, a, a press call where they played some tapes of Joe Biden uh, pressing uh, the previous Ukrainian president Poroshenko to take reforms. And they tried to make it sound nefarious, but there actually wasn't anything there. But right. I think if anything, what it shows is therefore the desperation of Trump that even being caught in the act of Ukraine, uh, of trying to extort Ukraine to get them to interfere with the election, it, he's still doing it because they, he has to. And I think, you know, when we started off um, talking about the scandals, um, and you mentioned sort of Christopher Wray now being sort of marginalized and opening up, or open, you know, cowing and opening up an investigation and investigators, you know, what that's about. I mean, there's two things that I think we have to think think about here politically. One is the is the likelihood that like Barr announces some indictment of some Obama official on for no reason, but just to sort of say, "Oh, look, here's a scandal, big deal, big deal, scandal, scandal, scandal," that can you know in October, eleven days out before an election, right? You indict Susan Rice on nothing because you can then create a scandal. <laughs> and make the appearance that Biden looks bad. The second aspect, and this is, I think, in some ways, um, I mean, I wouldn't say more serious because the other one is a total bastardization of the rule of law in the United States um, and is, you know, jailing your political opponents is, is insane. Um, the other aspect is opening the door to Russian interference again uh, in 2020. Now, if you were sitting at the FBI and you're an FBI agent and you're, told to, you know, there's, you suspect Russian interference happening. What are you going to do? You know, the FBI director just announced an investigation into the investigators. You want to keep your job. You don't want to be the target of, uh, you don't want to be Peter Strzok and Lisa Page, you know, where mm -hmm. you get thrown out in congressional hearings for doing your job and investigating, you know, foreign interference. And if you're in the intelligence community, are you going to want, are you going to sort of, you know, vigorously counter foreign interference by highlighting it publicly, by saying Russia's doing this. We saw this in the beginning of the year, where a, a nonpartisan civil servant from the DNI briefed Congress that Russia was seeking to interfere in the election. And guess what? She was railroaded and basically marginalized and I think has yeah. uh, been pushed out. And so where, where we are is that there is no U.S. government federal government that is able to protect us from foreign interference this go around this time around because trump has now john ratcliffe is in charge of the dn director of national intelligence replaces another political hack richard grinnell uh and so it's it's the you know there's no one the there's you know the wolf is guarding the the hen house here and so the door is wide open for vladimir putin to interfere in this election in the u.s intelligence community I highly doubt they're going to say anything. They don't want this to happen. They don't want to, no one wants to lose their job or be the target of a vicious right wing smear campaign. So the, that that's worked and that's yeah. essentially very serious going forward. 
is it could mean um, also not just disinformation campaigns, not just hacking and leaking of information, but just a actual you know cyber assault on our um, voting systems, which is Russian you know uh, intelligence services totally have the capability to do. So that's a real a real fear going forward. Do, do we know any more information about what Russia is already doing or planning? I'm seeing a lot of movement on social media too, uh, you know, a lot more of that stuff happening. But um, beyond what you've alluded to, do we have any more specificity about what I mean, I, may be up to this go around? I mean, I think I could also see, see potential false flag operations or, you know, paying people to say disparaging things about different candidates. Um, or finding, you know, different assets in, in the United States that can be, that you can use to, um, to, to push damaging information. I, I think in some ways we sort of know their toolkit. I think the online disinformation space is a bit harder now. We're more attuned to it. The social media companies are a bit more aware. But there's nothing to prevent Russia from doing much of what it did the last time, spending money in the U.S. election. Uh, in fact, those guys love Parnas and Igor Fruman. That some that if we remember those names, it sounds like a decade ago. Right. Or is it just like three months, uh, yeah, four months really. ago? You know, right. they were arrested. They were arrested for being fronts for Russian and Ukrainian money to come into the U.S. political system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is a major vector for for influence to provide to simply provide money to right wing campaigns and not just the Trump campaign, but the whole sort of broader right wing ecosystem. Um, so I think there's a whole host of tools, you know, uh, hacking Zoom calls from a Biden campaign and then releasing them, right? Like that same, it's all, that toolkit is still there. The, I think the question is, to me, Russia seemed like it held back a bit in, in 2016 in actually assaulting um, the cyber infrastructure of our election system. Yeah, yeah, that may be on offing uh, this time around. So, um, you know, I think, you know, it can look pretty much the same to some degree. I think Russia has to get a little bit clever, more clever in how they leak and release information. WikiLeaks has sort of been taken off. Um, but there's all sorts of other ways of, of pushing narratives, getting stories out there. So um, um, it's, it, yeah, it, the, so. You know, we, it's not like, you know, the thing I say, is they don't really have to get that much more creative because it's not like we've really responded to their efforts. Yeah, in right. Right. And it's also a question of whether we were even more ready to respond to what they did before, whether we're in a position to or fully prepared or, right. or what have you. You know, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, he is also the host, we should mention, of the Asset Podcast. Guess who the asset is? Y'all can figure it out on, at home later boys and girls. Uh, <laughs> Max, um, glad you and the family are, are healthy and uh, glad the business has recovered. Um, folks, um, uh, we talk a lot about Russia and, and all of that, but Max is clearly still sheltering at home. Those, that's why he, those birds sound beautiful. He's outside. Oh, so, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm very pleasant. For Fortunately, my kids stayed relatively quiet this time. So <laughs> yeah, no, no, but it's it's very pleasant. I, I almost feel like I'm I'm right out there with you. I wish I were. I'm still here in the epicenter in New York. So yeah. Um, but buddy, thank you, man. Uh, follow uh, the Moscow Project on Twitter and also uh, go to uh, the website as well to keep up with everything. The Moscow Project org. Max Bergman with two ends. Also on Twitter, check him out there. Max, as always, buddy, it's a pleasure, man. All right. Thanks so much. Take care, Mark. All right. Thank you. You too. God, you are our refuge. Send our ancestors to guard our doors. Cast out this virus from our communities and our bodies. Heal, bless, and protect everyone listening and their loved ones. Thank you for listening to Make It Plain and Get Woke. Remember to listen, like, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. If all minds are clear, it has been made plain.